The Trinity is often a doctrine that's hard to understand and maybe even harder to explain if you believe it by faith. Uh, my uh, late aunt often would question me about the Trinity because she just had uh, trouble in her mind understanding exactly how it was God but three persons, but it's not three gods. And, and uh, I try several different ways to explain it. And probably the one that you've all heard most uh, commonly is water. And, uh, or H2O, and, but it can come in three states. It can be liquid, it can be a gas, a steam, and it can be a solid and it's frozen, but uh, ultimately water. So that's a one example. And the other example sometimes people use as an egg that is three parts, but still one egg. You have the shell, the yolk, and the, the white, the egg white. Uh, so those are just a couple of quick examples, and usually those uh, suffice if the children come and say, Mommy or Daddy or Teacher, you know, what's the Trinity mean? And you give them one of those examples, and Usually they'll, they'll kind of run off happily, figure, okay, well, that's good enough for me now. But then as we get older and we want to parse things and we want to intellectualize things, we want to understand things fully, which is fine. Uh, the Bible's not supposed to just be milk all the time. We're supposed to dig into the meat of the Word. Uh, but when it comes to the Trinity, it's often very difficult to fully comprehend. And, and uh, my desire over the next couple of weeks is to try to dig into a little bit more to understand as best we can what the Trinity actually is. In Deuteronomy 6.4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. And if you hear the term Elohim in the Old Testament, that is a plural for God. But it doesn't mean three different gods or multiple gods, but it is to identify the fact that God is more than just God the Father or more than just Jesus or more than just the Holy Spirit. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in his second letter, in 2 Corinthians 13.14, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So he identifies the three aspects of God, the Trinity there, the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. So right there, any religion that tells you that there is not a Trinity, they don't believe in a Trinity, you can point them right to that verse, and it very clearly delineates all three parts of the Trinity. And so you know that if they deny any one of those three parts, that it is not a Christian religion. Biblical illiteracy is widespread in our country, and many people have never gone to church and know nothing about the Bible. So if you start to get into a discussion of that, and they start to challenge you on that, and you start to intellectualize and start pulling out scriptures, their eyes will probably kind of glaze over, and they'll probably, you'll probably lose them in the first sentence or two. But the, the sad thing about it is there are many Christians who have been to church all their lives who still couldn't explain uh, any, any part of the Trinity or exactly how it works. And, and uh, may not even fully understand that there is a triune God. Or, by the way, by extension, being His creation, we people, human beings, are triune beings as well. So of all the things which <clears throat> Christians say about God, the most distinctive is that God is three distinct persons in one Godhead. And no other religion worships a three-in-one entity or deity. So one of the marks of a cult is that they deny Jesus is God. You would often hear that. They will pick on God the Father or the supreme being or, you know, the whatever God spirit is out there or Allah or whatever they might call, they usually, if they're not just atheists, outright atheists, they'll try to acknowledge there's something out there, some nebulous uh, higher power, perhaps. Um, they might say that there's a spirit, they can feel the spirit, and sometimes, especially the New Age movement, uh, will uh, often uh, co-opt the term spirit as your inner spirit, as your inner self. And yes, we have a human spirit, but that is not the only spirit. It's not certainly the Holy Spirit, uh, but uh, they might acknowledge there's some sort of the spirit of the world, or the spirit of people, I love the spirit of the people in this room, or something, use some sort of euphemism like that, but they'll acknowledge some sort of spirit world or whatever. But where they, they seem to attack uh, Christianity, especially is Jesus, the manifestation of God in the flesh. And the reason they do that is simple, because they don't want to know of a Jesus who, died, who came in the earth, died on the cross, and then rose again for their sin because they don't want to acknowledge that they are sinful. And so you have Jesus, God in human form, who has done all this for us because of his love for us, despite the way we abuse him and use him, and yet he still unconditionally loves us for that. So uh, one of the first hallmarks of a cult or a false religion is that they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. We're talking to, in Sunday school this morning, and Dale Powers was here, he was talking about a friend of his uh, who uh, was uh, some aspect of uh, Islam, and uh, said that, uh, oh, Jesus was a good, good man, he was, a, he was a good prophet, not the Son of God, certainly not God, but he was, he was a good man, and, and Islam will teach that, uh, that Jesus was certainly a prophet, uh, maybe 
almost as important as uh, Muhammad, but certainly not the, the only begotten Son of God. Mormons, on the other hand, will say Jesus is God's Son, but we are all sons and daughters of God, and Jesus was a man like you and me, but he was elevated to God's status. And perhaps if we're good enough someday, we could all be elevated to God's status. Uh, but again, denying the unique aspect of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, Jesus said, I am. Which means I always have been, I am, I always will be. No one, none of us can ever say that. Nobody else can say that but Jesus Christ and God. Jesus said, you're looking for the Father. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he is recognizing the fact that you are also are looking at God himself. Now the word Trinity, by the way, is not found in the Bible. Uh, it comes from a Latin word which means three in one. It was first used by an early church father, Tertullian, in 220 A.D. when he used the phrase, three persons, one substance, to describe the Trinity, to defend the Christian faith against those who were attacking it and didn't believe in the Trinity. So he came up with the word Trinity, which means three persons, one substance. A Baptist theologian by the name of Augustus Strong defined the Trinity as, we do not say that one God is three gods, nor that one person is three persons, nor that three gods are one God, but only that there is one God with three distinctions of his being. There's a uh, phrase called modal trinitarianism, which means one God, three persons. But what he is saying here, he's parsing that a little bit, he's saying one God with three distinct, uh, with three distinctions of his being, but still the same God, one God. And theologian Henry Thiessen in 1949 said, By Trinity we mean that there are three eternal persons in one divine essence known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that doesn't clear up for you. I don't know what will. Well, here's some examples. For example, they use Peter, James, and John are not a Trinity. They are three persons, but they are not the same, and they are not equal. And just for example, there are three pews here in, in front of me. Uh, they all look alike, probably constructed of the same material, maybe even from the same tree, but they are not a trinity. But God has, is a trinity because he is the same God. He's expressed in three different ways. God is one being, yet three persons. However, they have one nature, a divine nature, the only one who can lay claim to that divine nature. Uh, for instance, a great many like to make a distinction by saying God is holy. But, God, but Christ is holy. Would you deny that Jesus Christ is holy? How about the Holy Spirit? So not just one is holy, but all three are holy. Or that uh, God, uh, God is love. The Bible says God is love. But Jesus is love. He expressed his love on the cross, dying for your sin when you didn't deserve it. And I didn't deserve it. And certainly the Holy Spirit is love. He dwells within us and points us towards God and expresses the love that comes out of us comes because of the Holy Spirit that is, is in us. God is infinite. Always has been. Always is and will be. Jesus is infinite. The Holy Spirit is infinite. So they are part of the Trinity. And, the, and if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to look at a little bit of Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul describes a little bit about the aspect of the Trinity. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 describes what each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, did to save us from our sins. So they all have something in common there, and that is that they all want to point us towards God. You know, we are a fallen being from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, all the rest of us are fallen beings. We are born in that, uh, that state of brokenness and of fallenness. And we have to acknowledge Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior in order to get back to where we should have been from the very beginning had we never fallen in the Garden of Eden. So all parts of the Trinity really want to point us towards that saving grace so that we can experience heaven forevermore. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We've been chosen by God. So some people take this on a run with predestination and say, well, certain ones have been chosen, but not everybody has been chosen. But I don't see a distinction here. I don't see a discrimination in here. He says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we, all we, should be holy. We're supposed, we have to be predestined to be holy with God, but we have to choose that. He doesn't force himself on anybody. It's been decided by God that he wants everybody in the entire history of the world and everybody alive today to be in concert with him. He wants everybody to be a Christian, in other words, to be born again. But we have to choose to be. He's not, going to, he's not a dictator. He's not going to force us to follow him. And that's obvious by walking out front of the church doors and you'll be immediately confronted with somebody, most likely, who's not a Christian as soon as you leave the church property. 
In, uh, so Jesus died in our place so our sins could be forgiven. In verse 7 there, in whom we have redemption. That's through Jesus. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So first of all, you had God the Father who predestined us in the fact to be with him forever. We were supposed to be holy like him forevermore. God designed us before he even created the world. He knew he was going to create the human race. And he created us so that we would have full, perfect communion with him. Jesus, the other second part, knowing that we have fallen miserably, but that he gives us a way to return to that and be restored back to God and return to that initial saving grace and through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So the second person of the Trinity also points us back towards God and to saving grace. And then in verse 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit seals us as a guarantee of our eternal salvation. In verse 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So once you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He came to dwell within you. you your body is a temple. And we said it before, in the Old Testament, you had to go to the temple to experience the presence of God. And only the high priest was allowed to go into the inner part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, and that was only on one day of the year, and he had to be very completely purified before he would go in, otherwise he would die upon contact. That's how holy God is. That's how holy his throne is today. We can't approach God's throne in our fallen state. We have to be holy and perfect, and the only way to do that is accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're going to receive a new body, and when sin condition has been taken away from us, the old flesh, then we will be worthy to be ushered into the very throne room of God. But until then, we are still not worthy. Only by grace are we saved. He sees us as righteous, but until we shed this flesh, this uh, spirit of man, we will not be fully uh, entered into the kingdom of God, into the, ushered into the inner sanctum. So, the Holy Spirit seals us as a guarantee of our eternal salvation. So in the Old Testament, they had to go to the temple for the presence of God. But we don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to come to church on Sunday to experience the presence of God. If you're a Christian, your body is the temple now. So what used to be bricks and mortar and stone is now flesh and blood. And God dwells inside each of us by His Holy Spirit. So we are to be holy. That's why it's so important for us to live a holy life. Because whenever we do commit sin, we are committing sin against God's temple. Or God's temple is causing uh, it is uh, seen as sinful, and we certainly don't want that to be seen by the world. We want people to see us as righteous and as holy. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. How can we as God's temple say some of the hateful things that we say to people or about people or gossip about people or bicker amongst ourselves or to fight? How can we do that when we have the Holy Spirit within us? The Bible uses the analogy of a fountain. How can sweet water and, and bitter water come out of the same fountain? It can't. It's got to be one or the other, so that's why we have to strive to be holy at all times. Each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, had a specific function in saving us from our sins so that we could become the children of God. Again, God designed us from the very beginning. Jesus Christ did the work on the cross when we fell. The Holy Spirit indwells us now and continues to point us towards an eternal and everlasting uh, glory in heaven with God the Father, with all the saints as well. So Paul includes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this benediction, and are each connected with the Word and showing that they are connected to and equal with one another. But their primary purpose is to point us toward God. Now they have other things that they also, other functions that they also uh, provide as well. But first and foremost, these other functions, let's say the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for example, do you no know good if you're not a Christian in the first place? So you have to, living the way that Jesus taught us to live, uh, by the Beatitudes of being meek and humble and holy and all that, it's nice to be a good person and to put other people first, but if you're not a Christian first, all those nice things are just dirty work, dirty rags in the sight of God. They mean nothing. So the grace of Christ to us. Now the word grace or charis is a Greek word. It means favor or goodwill or loving kindness. And the basic idea of the word is that of a free and undeserved gift that's not earned or deserved by us. And can never be achieved through our efforts, and we are unable to do that by our own effort. But in Romans 6.23 it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So it's a gift of God that we are allowed and able to become born again. 
uh, through Jesus Christ and, and become temples of God. So here wages and the gifts are contrasted with each other. Wages are what you are owed for your work while a gift is given for what you did not work for. So if you go to, to work in the morning and you put in your time, you punch your clock, you fill out your time sheet, you do whatever you have to do, then on Friday or every other Friday or twice a month, however, you get paid. Uh, and if you're on commission, then they'll calculate that and you maybe get a separate commission check. Or maybe you get a bonus or something. But you work for that. You earn that. That is yours. On the other hand, if you let's say it's Christmas time and you have a very generous boss and a company that is doing well, and they say, well, here's your paycheck. Oh, by the way, here's a Christmas bonus. That's great, because you didn't do anything extra to, to earn it. They just, by their favor, by their blessing, by their grace, they're giving you an extra bonus. So if you are, have somebody at home, maybe, somebody who gives you a, a special gift, just because, this is acting out of a spirit of grace, because they just want to bless you, they love you, they want to let you know that, that you were, they were thinking of you, and that sort of thing. And Jesus Christ did that, giving us the gift of grace on the cross, even though we didn't deserve it, and there's nothing we can do to earn it. That is not a wage, that is simply a gift, a bonus, a blessing. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now you can't get any poorer than he had everything completely stripped from his, his being, from his body, he had no earthly possessions, and didn't even have other than just the robe on his back when he was being tortured and being crucified. And to mock him, they put an expensive purple robe around him. Here's your king, because kings wore purple robes. It was a sign of royalty. You don't even have a crown as a king. <clears throat> so here's a crown of thorns. We'll place that on your head. So here you are, Jews. Here's your king. We even gave you a robe for the king. And of course, they turned their backs completely on him, and they mocked him as a result of that. But Jesus became completely destitute, humble, in, in abject poverty. He had absolutely nothing other than this robe that they gave him to put on him. So here he was, creator of the earth, our Lord and Savior to be, to be, was it yet, hadn't risen from the dead yet, from the throne of heaven, all the riches in heaven, streets, uh, he make it a heaven, it's, the streets are paved with gold, there's so much gold up there, that he has all the, everything on the earth is his, the cattle of a thousand hills belong to him, yet he gave it all up, just so he could die on the cross and shed his blood for us, so that we might, we might, not guaranteed we might accept the gift that he's given us, his shed blood, our salvation. Grace is never cheap because some sacrifices, uh, someone sacrifices for our benefit. It's never free because someone else pays the price. If someone gives you a gift just because, well, it costs them something to do that. If they made it, so it cost them some time and maybe some materials. If it's a, if it's a handcraft or something like that, that's fine. Or if they went to the store and bought you something, it's, it, it costs them something to, to bless you with that. If they even if just came over to your house just to share some time and maybe a cup of coffee, it still cost them the time, maybe the gas to get over to your house just to be a friend, and that's all well and good, and God bless them, them and God bless friends like that, but it's still, it was a sacrifice on their part, maybe minor, but it's still, if you think about it, when it's all said and done, still a bit of a sacrifice because they could have been doing something else. So grace is never cheap. His grace was in giving his life so that we could have eternal life. The title, Lord Jesus Christ, is the full title and name of our Savior. And Paul used his full title to emphasize his character. And the Lord means Lord or Master who is sovereign over all. Jesus means Jehovah, his salvation, or salvation comes from Jehovah. And Christ means the anointed one specifically chosen by God as our Savior. So, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one we acknowledge as, as King, ruler over us, the one who died on the cross by his grace, <clears throat> the one who is specifically chosen by God as our Savior. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ dying in our place and deserve nothing but God's judgment for our sins as a result of that. So again, the Holy the Trinity working together and using the manifestation of the physical appearance of God when something is manifested is made known to you. Uh, God is made known to us. Remember, we couldn't see God. Moses wanted to see God. God said, you can't handle it. He'll just... He'll, You'll die, you'll explode or something, but you know, you're know you only human, you can't see God. But I'll tell you what, Moses, in this particular case, I'm going to pass by you and I'll let you see my back. That's about all you could ever possibly handle. Remember when Moses came down from the mountain after the Ten Commandments, he was glowing so bright that he put a veil over his face because they could. it was so bright you couldn't see. It's like looking into the sun, but brighter. His face shone with the glory of God. We're going to be able to witness that and experience that for all eternity. We'll be able to handle it. 
at that time, but right now we can just barely handle just a portion of God's glory and grace. All of you are familiar with the hymn, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within, Grace, Grace, God's Grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. We continue to live by His grace, forgiving us of our sins, even though we are saved from eternal punishment. We're not perfect. Anybody says that they're perfect, raise your hand. You're not perfect any longer because you just lied. So we continue to need His grace to forgive us of our sins, even as Christians. So, grace on the cross. Praise God, we're all going to heaven. I trust everybody here today, as far as I know and understand, as so I know each of you as well as I do. As far as I know, all of you are going to heaven. So we're all going to meet there someday. Praise God, we'll be perfect then. But we all have different levels of holiness here in this church. I know that as well. And sometimes we're a little bit more holy than, than other times we are holy. Some of us, uh, maybe we're really holy on Sunday mornings because we've got to go to church and we know, well, I'm going to be in the presence of God. I'm going to sing about God. I'm going to read God's Word. And I know that I did something yesterday that I probably should have done. And so... God, when I go up in the church, I want to be as holy as I can, so you, you, maybe you get down on your knees, or the night before, or maybe on your way to church, you ask God, God, forgive me of my sin, I know that I did something yesterday, or I said something that I shouldn't have, and please forgive me, and here's the great thing, he, okay, I'll forgive you, thank you for being humble, and admitting, and repenting of your sin, you're forgiven, you come into church, you feel good, and then Monday comes, and we start the whole cycle over again, perhaps, or maybe not even Monday, maybe Sunday night comes, but the good news is by God's grace, every time you do sin, you can ask God to forgive you of your sin. And every time you ask God to genuinely forgive you of your sin, He genuinely forgives you of your sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. So God's love towards us, God's agape love, unconditional love, Caring about the well-being of someone, even if you, they don't love you back. Unconditional love. It's not a feeling, but it's a choice that you make. Now, I uh, often run into this sometimes when I'm counseling uh, couples that want to get married, or sometimes marriage counseling after they've been married a while. And, uh, you know, they, they, they I don't love so-and-so anymore. Or, I, I'm not sure if I do love. Or, we're all about love. You know, we knew the first time we met it was love at first sight. And uh, so you do have that feeling, that emotion of love. But love is a choice. God chose to love us unconditionally, even though we didn't deserve it. When you fall in love with somebody, you're actually choosing to fall in love with that person. Because there are a lot of other people out there. Ladies, there are a lot of other handsome men out there. Men, there are a lot of pretty ladies out there as well. Why did you choose to love this particular, or fall in love with this particular person? And it's usually a lot more than just physical attraction. Hopefully it's a lot more than that. It's their personality. It's, it's who they are. It's maybe their interests. Maybe their hobbies. Maybe you have something in common in your backgrounds. I mean, lots of different things, and the whole package comes together. You say, this is the special person for me in my life. This is the one I want to share my, my life with. And that may be an immediate attraction. You may know very early on that that's the person for you. In other cases, maybe somebody you didn't really care for initially, but they kind of grew on you. And over time, you started to find some common ground. And before you know it, then eventually maybe you fell in love. Maybe it was an old high school sweetheart that you forgot about completely. And then you got reacquainted somehow down the road and and eventually fell in love. But back in high school, you wouldn't have anything to do with that particular person. But love is a choice, and God chooses to love us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And God the Father loved us so much, He was willing to sacrifice His only Son so that we could become His children as well. He sacrificed one Son so that He could gain a whole bunch of sons and daughters. And the one son was able to overcome sin, death, and the grave so that all of us could join the family. We could all be adopted into God's family. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons, Ephesians 1.5. It was because God loves us that he chose us to become his children, not because we deserved it or earned it. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the uh, chorus that we sing from time to time. So we'll keep ourselves in the love of God by obeying His commands and honoring Him with our attitudes. How do you show that you love somebody? How did you show that you love God? The Bible says that you keep His commandments. That's how you show that you love somebody. How do you show that you love someone uh, here on this earth? By 
Okay, they ask you to do a favor. You, you do a favor for them. You work together. You do things for each other. Sometimes without even being asked to do something. Remember that first and glorious time, parents, or maybe it's yet to come, where your child uh, walked in and said, I already made my bed and cleaned up my room. You didn't have to badger them or ask them to do that. How much more? They just, you just loved them just a little bit more that, that day because they did something for you. Or if they did come home, maybe it's a child and they, they were, you know, coloring in, in kindergarten or first grade. They came home and said, look what I drew for you. And you put that on the refrigerator. They didn't have to do that, but they were thinking of mommy and daddy that day. And said, I'm going to draw a little picture. And they handed it to you. You didn't, you didn't ask them to do that, but it was their grace. You know, even children can express grace by giving you a gift that you didn't earn. Maybe you were actually kind of grouchy that morning when you sent the kids off to school, but they came home and they gave you a little flower or something. Well, God's the same way. The way we treat Him, and yet He still extends His grace towards us, even though we often don't deserve it. So we will serve God with our abilities and our time, and we'll worship God with our whole heart, our mind, and our strength. And that's how we can give God back grace by giving Him of ourselves, by sacrificing something of ourselves just because we love God. So we sacrifice our time by coming to church, by reading the Bible, by praying, or by teaching, or volunteering and doing something in the kingdom of God. That is us making a sacrifice and expressing to God our blessing to Him. Praising and singing His praises, a blessing as well. Warren Worsby wrote, when our lives are motivated more and more by the love of God, it's evidence that we are maturing spiritually. Instead of our own self-love, instead of our own self-aggrandizement, instead of our own joys and our own pleasures, we start thinking about, how can I please God today? Then you're starting to down that road of spiritual maturity. And you know what? When you start down that road, you're going to find that God is even going to bless you more. By giving more of yourself, God is going to bless you more in return. It's not about going out and getting it for yourself. Let God give you whatever He wants to give you instead of going for it for yourself. Romans 5, 5, And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Again, the Trinity all working together, hand in hand, to perfect us and to, uh, to love us and to show us the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ, the manifestation of God. We will love those who don't love us the way we love them. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. Again, we will love those who don't love us the way that we love them. In other words, we may love them wholeheartedly, and they love us half-heartedly back, or maybe not at all. But a sign of spiritual maturity, because God is in us, is that we also need to learn to love unconditionally. You love people unconditionally by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, even when they make fun of you of being a Christian. Number two, we will love those we don't naturally get along with. That means witnessing to everybody. Not everybody is going to be on the same plane that we are, have the same kind of personality uh, that we have. And we're not always just going to generally and, and automatically mesh with everybody. Sometimes there's some, you know, little grading going on there, but we still love them. We still care for them. We still want to witness to them. And we, love, uh, we will love others without any strings attached. I'll love you if. I'll love you however. I'll love you but. But the true sign of spiritual maturity is I love you. Period. Can you get to that point? Because that's what God did for us. I love you. Period. Then we join into fellowship. Koinonia, an association or fellowship and partnership, comes from the word to share things you have in common. Members of a family share a common house together. You share common relatives, maybe common food, uh, uh, things that you enjoy, entertainment things that you enjoy, and so forth. You share something in common. You have a koinonia with your own family, but we also have a, a family of God that we should share as well. Acts 4.32, those who believed were of one heart and, and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they shared everything in common. That was the early church. Everything which mine is yours, which yours is mine, and we just all share it together. Anything, anything that I can do to help you out, I'm going to help you out. Anything that you can do to help me out, you help me out, and it's just because we love, and we're all part of the same family. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us when we become a Christian, and His presence in our lives means we have a relationship with God. And we live our Christian life by the presence of and with the help of and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So that's I'm just touching on the surface today. We're going to get into a little more detail in the next couple of weeks of the Trinity. But I just wanted to kind of give you an understanding that if the, the Trinity, if the Trinity didn't do anything else <coughs> except point us towards salvation, we should be thankful for that because then we don't have to spend an eternity in hell. But it does so much more for us. And so as we start to delve into that in a little bit more detail, just understand that it's God, one God, 
And he's expressed three different ways to us for three different purposes, but all with the same goal in mind for us to have complete and pure eternal fellowship with him forevermore. I pray that we can get there that way, get there someday in heaven, uh, but in the meantime, there's no reason to, to, to not start in that right now and join the presence of God and to sharing that with other people around us that we know are not Christians. But we know that we want to pray for them so that they can enjoy the same benefits that we enjoy as children adopted into God's family. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray to God, and the Bible says to pray to God in the name of Jesus. So, Father God, we pray to you, and we thank you for understanding. The Bible also says that your Holy Spirit will help us understand these truths. So, Father God, as we read your word, the word made flesh through Jesus Christ, may we, your Holy Spirit then work with us as we're reading your word to understand your nature. So again, all things working together for good. So Father, help us to understand to the best of our understanding and ability the Trinity. And if someone were to ask us, to help us, Lord, to give a, an adequate answer for that particular time, for that particular person. Not everybody needs a long theological uh, discussion about it. Some people have more faith than others, and a simple illustration is all that is needed. Help us by the discernment of your Holy Spirit to know exactly what needs to be said, how much needs to be said, how deep we need to go. But I pray, Lord, that your truth will always come through our lips. If there is somebody here this morning that has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, that, that burden, that urge that you're, you feel inside of you, that's God's voice by the Holy Spirit saying, you really should accept my Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. He died on the cross for you. He shed His blood for you. Why not accept Him as your personal Lord and Savior? As a Christian this morning, maybe you haven't been living your life in a way that you know has been totally pleasing or in concert with the Word of God. That little nagging voice, that's the Holy Spirit. I know you've heard that one before. And it's telling you to confess your sins. Telling you to do it right now, right there where you're sitting. Acknowledge and repent of your sins. And the good news is while you're right there sitting now, God has forgiven you of your sins. Because Jesus Christ, the shed blood has already washed them away. And now you can put a smile on your face knowing that you're back in full fellowship with God Almighty. Lord, we're praying for other people that we know that are not Christians. It may be family members, neighbors, friends, co-workers. The world at large needs a great revival. Help us to do our small part, whatever it is you call us to do. If you call us to witness to one person this week, I pray that we will be obedient to witness to that one person this week. If you call us to witness to 100 people this week, I pray that we will be obedient 100 times to witness to 100 people. But we know, Lord, that all we can do is witness. Your Holy Spirit will do the convicting. And they have to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers, for knowing us, Lord, better than we know ourselves. We thank you for the blessings you pour out in our life each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.